Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Hi, you're listening to Great Women in Compliance on the Compliance Podcast Network with Mary Shirley and me, Lisa Fine. Today is the day after International Women's Day, and I am so excited to be speaking with Allison Hines Pearl. She is the Chief Compliance Officer and Assistant General Counsel at Revlon. Prior to taking on this role, Allison had senior roles at MasterCard and Bayer Corporation. I first met Allison and heard her speak at Converge on a panel called uh, CECO Inspo, which left me really inspired. All four of these women on the panel were in in different industries. And as I looked at Allison's role, I saw how she had been in two highly regulated, specifically regulated industry, pharma and finance. And now in a multinational, which focuses on personal care, cosmetics, and beauty products. If you agree with me, if you agree as I do with the quote that the only constant in life is change, then you are in the right place today. So I'm so happy to be with you on Women's History Month, and thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa, mm-hmm. for hosting this amazing podcast. And I am so happy that you invited me uh, to join this really thoughtful conversation, especially at this time during Women's History Month and the day after International Women's Day. So very excited to be here with you today. Thank you. So with that, let's start with how did you get into compliance initially? So I'd have to say it's quite by by accident, right? One of the great advantages of uh, of being an in-house lawyer is that there always there's always more legal issues to tackle than there are lawyers to solve for them. So when I started my in-house career, I, I joined uh, Quest Diagnostics to to manage litigation, and I was eventually able to expand into other disciplines that. That, that just piqued my, my curiosity at the time, which were regulatory compliance, where I eventually supported the chief regulatory officer and the chief laboratory officer, and also public policy, which, which really helped me as sort of a, a, a early career lawyer understand the impact of policy on business. And, and that role expansion helped prepare me to join Bear initially in a business role leading reimbursement strategy, right? But but working closely with the public policy team and uh, interfacing with, with customers before I took the leap back into a legal role and really continued my legal and compliance journey. Uh, I, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but these were really among the building blocks of, of what I characterizes challenging experiences and even career risks that were supported by great mentors and sponsors. And of course, you know, my very wonderful family. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we all kind of come up with building blocks by accident, and then they end up often many of us into an ethics and compliance career. Right. Um, so in your most recent role, in your current role, you're the chief compliance officer at Revlon. So, and you also changed the organizations and leading a new team. And you did that all during the pandemic. And most of it was virtual. Um, talk about how that, what, what that was like to start and your experience. Absolutely. So there, look, there's no words to express the human loss from the pandemic. And for the purposes of our conversation, I'm talking about the narrow impact of the pandemic from a, you know, from a professional standpoint. Uh, as much as the pandemic may have increased the hours in a working day for so many of us, it also, it really forced me to think about my career goals. If the pandemic causes a premature end to my own story, did I at least try to do all the things I wanted to do professionally? No question, right, that so far in my career, I have I have so much to be grateful for. I started off trying cases in the Bronx District Attorney's Office, then developed solid litigation skills, learned healthcare law with a boutique Manhattan firm. And then what I like to call leaping and reaping the benefits of an in-house legal career, which included, you know, taking it global. I worked um, in Germany for Bayer for a few months, uh, came back to the U.S. uh, with with Bayer, 
in an expanded role and bundle that experience to bring to MasterCard and lead its uh, compliance efforts for its North America business unit. Then I realized that what I, I had left to try professionally was to serve a company as its global chief compliance officer. So at a virtual networking event before the pandemic, I mentioned, I said it, I mentioned I was open to what's next for me. I had not done anything. I had not updated my resume yet. I hadn't started looking but I said it, I said it out loud. And a couple of months later, uh, through my network, I was approached about the opportunity at Revlon. I, you know, I interviewed virtually, which really allowed me to meet more people and learn more about the company uh, before I joined. It's interesting. I, I think I've told you that when I started at Pearson, I didn't meet anybody in person until my first day at work. And I remember <laughs> thinking that morning, all of, and I met a lot of people, learned a ton about the organization, but I thought, you know, at the end of the day today, I'm going to know a lot of names and a lot of things about a lot of people that are going to become very important in my life. I have no clue who they are this morning, <laughs> but that was very pre-pandemic. Um, what challenges did you have from, from that, from your viewpoint, either from not being in the office or starting at that time? Well, I think... By the time I started, because I started uh, at Revlon in in at the end of May of 2021, and by that time, I think the world was just used to operating in a virtual environment and navigating. Is my should my camera be on? Should my camera be off? <laughs> so I think that I, I think for the most part operating virtually was something that we had we had grown to accept. Now, I personally feel very fortunate to have inherited an amazingly mighty team at Revlon. My my remit not only includes the core compliance as, as we all know, but also employment law and security among other areas and and I think one of the challenges is maintaining such an amazingly mighty team. There's, there's lots of competition out there for great talent. In-house legal departments are typically flat. Yet, because our team is small, and, and I like to say we like each other, um, and there's, a, there's just a lot of opportunity uh, to grow, to be curious, to learn new areas and develop a great internal network. And, and these things, I think, in addition to money, sort of really help. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the opportunity to be able to continue learning and to build your career, whether it's in your current role or helping people who may say, I might not want to do this down the line to build those relationships for the future, make a huge difference. And to especially, I've never really heard of a, a compliance team that says we have too many people. So, <laughs> you know, it sounds like, you know, not only does everyone like each other, it sounds like a small but mighty team, which is what, you know, I think we all deal with sometimes. Um, it sounds like that may have given you some um, unexpected opportunities as well in working with your team that maybe are a benefit to some of the ability to be virtual and to not necessarily be in person. Absolutely. So, so one of the unexpected opportunities, I would say, is, is not just with the small and mighty team that, that I inherited, but also working very closely with incredibly smart, savvy, and decisive women leaders. That was a really unexpected benefit in terms of joining the Revlon team. As you may know, our, our CEO is a woman, our CFO is a woman, our general counsel uh, is a woman. These are all strong, inspirational and, and really visionary leaders, just to name a few. I mean, inclusion and diversity, they really matter. And, and you see it, you see it at Revlon, which is so important to me. Yeah, that's, that's just fantastic. I mean, still the number of CEOs and CFOs, women versus men is, is still lagging. So to really have that as a, a leadership team is really just a fantastic thing and a fantastic group of people to collaborate with. Um, the other thing that seems unusual and, and different um, and I've seen this in, in my experience because I've been I've had people come in to both the companies I've worked at in-house coming from more highly regu regulated industries like, you know, pharma or financial. And 
The difference is you still have a lot of issues in multinational corporations, but they're very different in terms of how regimented, or at least my experience has been, and sometimes, and you know, certain laws that you have to be fully accountable for. And so one of the things I've seen is that can be a surprising change. Um, and I was wondering how that had gone. You've now done it in two different contexts. And I wanted to understand and hear a little more about your experience with that. Yeah. So look, from my express from my perspective, the the, the common sort of compliance denominator, will, if you will, across healthcare and financial services is the importance of building the right policies, having the right processes, and implementing the right tools to really empower employees in whatever business you're in to simply do the right thing. So whether it's it's combating fraud, waste, and abuse in the healthcare sector under the watchful eye of uh, Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, the OIG, or, or managing the risk of c- corruption in the healthcare sector or in the financial services sector to keep the Department of Justice and the Securities Exchange Commission from knocking at your door or or managing the risk of you know, terrorist financing or money laundering in the financial services sector to satisfy the expectations of the Department of Treasury, FinCEN. The importance of an effective, living, breathing compliance program is, is, is critical. Yeah, I, I just I know one of the things that I always find interesting is that it's all about ethical decision making. But it seems like often, at least in my experience, I've also had you have a different approach of, you know, who is sort of the the last, you know, the, the last line of defense or the, per, the organization that's looking you know into what you're doing. And I think in, I've seen at least it here in what I do is you do have a little more ability to be creative on how do you get people to different answers um, because you don't have some of the same. You know, regulatory requirements. On the other hand, what you're ultimately doing is still pretty much the same, no matter where you are. So, that's yeah, one and, I think, and I think there's, there's, you know, there's for for it's no different, really, for for Revlon. The importance of an effective compliance program is no less important here. I mean, you know, some of the the basic tenets of the things that we we do every day, right? Being visible, being present, being available for employees to to encourage them to bring issues forward, right? Getting, getting, getting creative with risk assessments, whether it's, you know, in a one-on-one conversation or if it's you know, through anonymous surveys, um, giving, giving data a voice, a voice that prompts me and, and our team to, to ask more questions, to, to explore uh, potential trends and really, and really think through process improvements. All of these are, 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 are vital across all sectors. Yeah, it, it is. And it's really important for all of us. And it also empowers people to make right decisions. And that's really what we ultimately want people to do, as well as ask us before anything, as opposed to thinking, I might just apologize later, not realizing the consequence of those actions. I think it's a, you know, and that's what I think all of us want to do in our programs. Um, and as we're talking about this, I mean, I know we've been in these, I, I know the word un, unprecedented is often overused now, but I mean, between in the last year with, with, with the pandemic, um, and you're changing your companies. I mean, we've talked a bit when we've spoken about change management, and then now we even have more issues with what's going on in the world. Um, you know, what do you see some of the most significant things and significant changes um, do you have? So, you know, what I, I so what I find compelling and, and challenging about compliance at the same time is that it evolves as the business evolves and as the laws affecting the business evolve. So there, there's always there's always new issues to, to solve for. You know, Bear and MasterCard, they were really good training grounds for me to, to learn how to build and sustain compliance programs that are are, are tailored to business and, and legal risk um, as as well as each company's tolerance for that risk. Um, so when I think about what lies ahead, what uh, what has what's top of mind for me is, you know, before the the, the Russia Ukrainian conflict, my my answer would have been, 
you know, ESG, right? No question that 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 how companies demonstrate innovative ways to preserve the environment, diversify their workforce, uh, protect their supply chains from issues like forced labor and 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 how they maintain healthy corporate controls, that will all continue to expand. Now it it goes without saying that the Russia Ukraine conflict has and and it will continue to have a far reaching impact not only on its citizens but on the world really. So from a business perspective that the impact of this this conflict will extend way beyond sanctions. Uh, you know, it's because you know what's in, what impacts businesses impacts compliance programs. So so definitely watching closely this conflict to see how it resolves and what the lingering uh, impact of that will be. Yeah, and and I think all of us are to some degree in the business of trying to help people. Um, yeah. And this is a, a di- whole different context, I think, than any of us have been really prepared for thinking about it in the past, um, even though we just kind of two years ago were doing something similar, trying to figure out how do you handle a global pandemic? And mm-hmm. I mean, there's so much going on in the world. Sometimes I, I, I wonder what I was worrying about back in 2015. <laughs> 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 so, you know, what do you think also, are these the most significant changes to you in compliance right now? Um, or are there some others that, you know, come to mind? No, I think, look, what, what's going on in the world, you know, whether it's, whether it's the, the pandemic, um, whether it's uh, social justice and uh, the view and the landscape following the tragic death of George Floyd, uh, whether it's the Russia or Ukrainian conflict, all of these things, they not just have a social impact, but they have an impact on, on, on business. And, and again, what, what, what impacts the business impacts our compliance programs and, and how we support the business and how we help uh, assess sort of legal and compliance risk, really. And it's, I mean, you, you've talked a little bit here about all of the different social justice movements and, and others. Um, as we're in Women's History Month and last month is Black History Month. Um, you're, you're as a woman, you're a woman of color. Do you have any specific moments or lessons you've learned that stuck with you or what you would, you know, like to share um, in those areas? There's something that really are, these things are really important to me and to the podcast. And we really want to get the benefit of other people's experiences in particular. Well, thank you for that. And I'll, and I'll, I'll share a quick story, uh, a story about my, my first week in the Bronx District Attorney's Office in the 90s. Uh, there was uh, a dozen or so of us newly minted assistants. We had, you know, men in their suits and ties and women in their skirt suits and eager and excited to, to jump in and do the right thing. Uh, senior assistants were training us. So we sat in the first row of uh, the courtroom in, in the criminal court building in the Bronx, and we were holding our criminal procedure handbooks there in our lap. And um, I wasn't the only woman in the class, but I was the, the only Black woman at that time. And after a, a, fe- a Black female defendant who was not wearing a skirt suit or, or not looking anything like me was sentenced to uh, probation, a white female clerk walked over to where I sat with my fellow assistants and handed me the Black female defendant's probation paperwork. Now, uh, I could have said a number of things, but I could hear my mother's voice saying to me, Be kind, but be firm. Keep your head up and work hard. So I took a breath and I told the clerk kindly, but firmly, the defendant is sitting in the back of the courtroom. I'm a new assistant and I told her my name. Now, I suspect a couple of the other assistants wanted to say something to me or to that clerk, but that that moment passed and was replaced with so many other incredibly great experiences in the DA's office. Like I said, this happened in the 90s, yet today, less than 5% of American lawyers are Black. So as a woman and as a Black woman, 
lawyer. I am absolutely thrilled with Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's historic nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court and elated that it occurred during Black History Month and that she will likely be confirmed during Women's History Month, which, in my view, includes a celebration of International Women's Day. I mean, it is in so many ways, it is really one of the greatest celebration of both months at one time. And in just such a qualified, you know, this is one of the most qualified judges, regardless of anything we're talking about right now, her record, her experience. It's just, it's amazing. Also being from DC and knowing when she was on that court, I feel a little bit, you know, I almost are like, this is fantastic on so, so many levels. I also think, um, you know, similarly to anything else, we, you know, the Supreme Court, I mean, I keep my own politics aside on certain things, but the more we can keep a court that's looking more like America or how we want our America to be, the better. And the gap of not having a Black woman is a life experience that will bring a tremendous amount to the court. And I think it's, you know, and she's just kind of amazing. I, you know, I do geek out a little bit following judges. So it's one of my really cool spare time habits, but um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, and, and it's amazing, but that is a, a real reality check from your day one. I have a, a, a very dear friend in that who worked at while with me who was just had just been made partner black woman and was the person running a negotiation and somebody, you know, she had the experience we've all heard about. Somebody asked her for coffee while the associate, you know, and, and then the associate, you know, like giving the young guy, the credit, he basically ran right over right away to the, the, the person who was like, look, I'll get it for you. She, you Holly needs to sit down now, <laughs> start for the deposition or whatever we were doing, but it's still out there. No, I mean, look, implicit bias is real. It didn't have a name. At that, at probably at the time of that experience, and certainly not at the time of my experience. And you know, these issues are, um, you know, they're coming to the fore now. Um, and I, look, I I believe that Judge Jackson, she will be a tremendous addition to the court. And and like you, I firmly believe that a court that looks like America makes better decisions for America. Just like same thing with any of our other departments, anywhere in an organization. I mean, I'm sure there'll be more statistics over time, the different companies, people trying to do the right thing, people trying to hear other opinions, lower risks, do better. Um, And not just because it's the right thing from a worldview, which I truly believe it is. It also makes practical business sense. So. I mean, I, and for me too, I mean, it's one of those things when people at every year, I sort of have my different goals about what, what I want to keep working on and doing for myself. And one of those things now is always implicit bias. Now, I don't know what my implicit biases are because they're mine, um, but I'm trying and it's an interesting thing. So with that, um, any other things you'd want to share about your experience or really what about Women's History Month that right now for you or even something else that you'd want to share with the audience? It's your opportunity. Well, I mean, I guess what I would share is how tremendously grateful I am uh, for the women and the black women that and black men that have gone, you know, before me. Um, I feel very fortunate to have traveled uh, this far in my career uh, from, you know, a little girl, a first generation American who who grew up in Queens uh, to the tremendous opportunity that I've I've had to date, and I'm still continuing to learn and to grow and to pay it forward and give it back and volunteer and make a difference in small everyday ways. And um, so I I just I have an incredibly grateful heart uh, for my experiences and the lives of people that have touched me and the lives of those who I have touched. Yeah. And I, like I said, I'm so grateful for you for spending some time with me and sharing some of that. I feel very grateful for that. I feel very, I feel very fortunate. 
both from the podcast and other things to get these opportunities to listen to phenomenal stories like, like yours and to get to meet people like you. And I wanted to just say, you know, thank you so much for that. Um, I like, it's great when you feel like you meet a, meet like a new friend through these processes. So um, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of Mary and me and the compliance podcast network for joining us on great women in compliance. And for everyone out there, we're now, this is, this is our last one of our winter semester as we call it. And I'm just so thrilled that this is how we are ending this, this semester. And thank you, Allison. No, oh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Mary. And I really enjoyed this uh, conversation. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review. 